In recent years, modern historians have denied the fact that America was founded as a Christian nation or founded on Christian principles. But America's Christian roots run deep and wide. You'll see that an estimated 95% uh, were practicing Christians and exercised their faith in public office and at home. And the other 5% acknowledged God and the, and the Bible as divine truth. But the number of Christians in America has been shrinking. A study was done in 2020 that showed that only 64% of Americans identify as Christians. 50 years ago, that number was 90%. And it is predicted in the near future that that percentage will drop below 50%. We seem to live in a world that feels as if it is steadily going downwards. The religious values that our country once held are being thrown out the window. Children are being taught things that should never be taught or we shouldn't have to worry about. We witness things that should never be done. And in the midst of it all, we ask, what happened to our country? Ronald Reagan once said, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, we will be one nation gone under. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell in all the nations that forget God. And it seems as if more and more people are constantly turning away from God. They forget God, or perhaps they don't feel like they need it. However, we know that God provides everything for us, so how could we possibly survive without Him? There is a serious problem in our country and in the world, but what are we going to do to resolve the issue? President Donald Trump made his run to office with the famous campaign slogan that was once used by Ronald Reagan, Make America Great Again. People filled the crowds at Trump rallies with hats and t-shirts with this slogan. Front yards proudly flew a flag with this slogan on it, MAGA as it was called, Make America Great Again. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not you like this man or voted for this man or anything. This is a slogan that I believe most Americans could get behind in some way or another. But in what ways it needed to be great is where we disagree. But we as Christians should all have the same idea. Sure, let's make America great again, but instead, we should take that slogan and kind of change it to make it our own. Instead, how about we make America a godly nation? Making America a godly nation again begins with us. It begins with the Christians of this nation. But how is that achieved? This is what I'd like to discuss this morning. How can we as Christians help to make America a godly nation again? Spread his word. There are four different things I would like to discuss that should help us help others to become Christians and come to him. They're not in any particular order. But the first one I would like to discuss is that we need to teach. The Gospel accounts of Matthew and Mark record in their last uh, chapter, the Great Commission. And if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 28, we'll just read that account of the last few verses of that chapter. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. There are two scenarios that I can think of right off the bat in which we should be teaching. Teaching those who are already Christians and teaching those in our lives who may not be. There are always things that we as Christians can learn. We can always further our knowledge. And there may be things that we can also teach other Christians. And so that is important that we are always trying to teach and help each other grow our knowledge to the best of our abilities. Because teaching is not just for the preacher, but we are all to be teaching one another. Especially teaching the small children of the world because they need to be raised learning and growing in the knowledge of the Lord. But we have to take this as a very serious commandment, to go out and teach the world. It amazes me sometimes how many people don't actually know about Christ. Because, of course, I've been raised in the church, so to me, that's just always been a part of my life. And it amazes me when I talk to someone who doesn't really know the story of Christ. 
Oftentimes I've just assumed that everyone at least knows the story, but has just decided to reject it. But there are tons and tons of people who have not learned. And the saddest part is, there may be people in our lives who do not know. People, people in our lives who may have not been taught. How sad is that? How people can be part of our lives and yet we haven't shared the gospel with them. We need to constantly be ready to teach the word. Of course, when you try to start off the conversation saying that you would like to talk about the gospel, many people will reject you and don't want to talk to you anymore. But people can come to learn that we are Christians by the way that we act or if we become friends with them, they, they learn why, okay, why are you busy on Sunday? Well, I got church. And suddenly when they got a question, you're the person they come to. So we must always be ready to teach the word because when we have an opportunity that arises, we do not want to miss out on that. The opportunity to teach also doesn't always come at a uh, convenient opportunity. Sometimes we may be doing something, but we must realize that this is a great opportunity. And teaching the world about Christ is one of the most important things that we as Christians are responsible for doing. So when it comes to trying to make America a great, na a godly nation again, it starts with us being ready to teach the word. And we also have to lead by example. There's a song in the songbook, number 512, that's titled, The World's Bible. And the first verse reads, Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongue but our tongues to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21 says, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I talked about this in the lesson, re lesson recently, about how we should have the attitude of Paul here. The attitude is, while we're living here on earth, our purpose should be for Christ, doing the work that he has set before us. And we all know the story very well. Jesus coming down to earth to live how he did, die as a sacrifice on our behalf. That he left us instructions, and it is our job to spread his word. Wouldn't it be interesting to know the number of people that Jesus Christ touched with his hands? We know that Jesus um, touched a lot of people when he healed them. Luke 4 and verse 4, he says, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and they were healed. Can you imagine what it would be like to be touched by the hands of the Savior of the world? Wouldn't it be interesting to know how many steps his feet took while he was walking around? We know that Jesus walked a lot in his life. There weren't cars at that point in time. He had to walk most of the places that he went. He went from town to town on foot preaching his good news. Can you imagine what it would be like to walk beside Jesus? There is no way to know how many people he touched or how many steps that he took. But isn't it fun to think about? No one in the history of mankind has such a personal impact or a global impact as Christ did. John said in his, uh, in his gospel, John 21 and verse 25, where he says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books. That would be written. Amen. There are so many times that the apostles even just wanted to take a break and rest, but he continued changing the world with his hands and his feet. One thing we can know is that Jesus relies on the Christians to continue, to continue changing the world for his cause. Now, I don't know about you, but there is absolutely nothing special about my hands or my feet. But when I'm doing the work of Jesus, that is as special as it gets. Jesus has entrusted us with continuing his work. He showed us what, what we are supposed to do by setting down an example and instructions. The truth is, he is no longer here on earth, walking city to city, preaching his word or changing people's lives with his hands, but he has left 
the Christians to do that. Jesus put faith in our ability to advance his mission of seeking and saving the lost while serving those in need. The question is, how have we lived up to the faith that he has put in us? Verse 2 of that song says, We are the only Bible the careless world will read. We are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. We are the Lord's last message given in, word, in deed and word. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? Titus chapter 2 and verse 7 says, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, and corruptibility. Because life is hard, worries and fears often surround us. If we let them in, they can take over our thoughts, monopolize your life, and sink your ship. Now, I would assume that most of you know someone who may be struggling. Maybe they live their lives in a constant state of fear or worry, constantly battling life storms. Perhaps that person is you. I mean, are we supposed to pretend that none of these things bothers us because we're Christians? Listen, Christians are not immune from life or the worries of life. We often want a way out to the storms of life are pressing down. And we want, we want to just press an easy button and make all the hurt and pain disappear. But it is how we handle those life storms that really matters. Because no matter how much we may not think, there are people who are watching. People notice how you handle things. And when people notice that you're handling things so well, and they're really dealing with a lot right now, but you put it into God's hands, not worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about its own things, and having 100% faith in God, that sticks with people. We should be living our lives according to the Bible, because if we are living according to what the Bible has told us, then our actions and our lives will reflect the Bible. So we must be careful. There's a little children's song that I remember being taught uh, when I was little in the Sunday school before services. I don't remember the title, but I know it started off with, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. And the song goes on and on. I don't remember how many verses. I think there is, be careful, little feet where you walk, all that kind of stuff. The song says to be careful because the Father up above is looking down in love. And while, yes, we need to be careful, watch what we're doing, because God sees everything, but we also need to be careful of where our eyes go, where our ears go, where we go and what we do, because there are people watching, especially children. Of course, I am far from being a father, but I do know that children love imitating the attributes of people around them. I know that because I always did that. I also know that because back to Fredertown, we have a lot of small children running around, but they're constantly, if they saw someone doing something, they're trying to imitate that. And so while we may send the children to Bible class and teach them to pray and read the Bible, they also learn a lot from the examples of people around them. There's a poem that I read that I thought was really good for this, and I'm sure I'll appreciate the poem a lot more if I do become a father one day, but I also thought it was thought-provoking because, like I said, there's a lot of children that I'm around constantly that they see how what I'm doing and how I act. And the poem says, A careful man I want to be, a little fellow follows me. I do not dare to go astray, for fear he will go the self-same way. I cannot once escape his eyes. Whatever he sees me do, he try. Like me, he says he's going to be the little chap who follows me. He thinks that I am good and fine, believes in every word of mine. The base in me, he must not see the little chap who follows me. I must remember as I go through summer sun and winter snow, I am building for the years to be the little chap who follows me. People watch our example. And so we must be careful what we're doing. Verse 3 of the song says, If our hands are busy with other things than his, 
Or what if our hands are busy with other things than his? What if our feet are walking where sin's allurement is? What if our tongues are speaking of things as life is spurred? How can we hope to help him and welcome his return? That children's song I just mentioned would have really actually been good to use here, but just think back to it. You know, when we become too busy for God, when we start to do the things that we shouldn't be doing, when we hang out places where we shouldn't be hanging out, there's a good chance that somebody notices. And how are we supposed to lead people to Christ by our example, if our example is not to find Christ? If we're expecting to try to bring people to Christ, we also need to shun evil. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. What I find interesting here is the phrase, abhor what is evil. There's a member back at Fredericktown who uh, was making a point similar to what I'm about to say. I thought it was really good, so I wanted to kind of expand on his point. You know, what, what is the definition of abhor? I don't know if I'm saying that right. I hope I am, but it is to regard with disgust and hatred. I'm sure that we all have food that we don't like. You know, uh, perhaps there's food that we would not even dare to touch because we just think it is so disgusting to the point of possibly wanting to throw up because of how disgusting this food may be to us. Now, there's not a lot of food that I personally have a problem with, but one of those is I do not like refried beans, and I do not like zucchini. I strongly dislike both of them, and be honest, if it were down to life or death due to starvation, and I only had the options to eat these, I may die. Not necessarily because I refuse to eat it, but because it might just come right back up from where it came. But children, as far as said, they provide such great examples. Take a child. If you try to feed them some sauerkraut, most children will hate and refuse to eat it. That is, unless their name was Luke Dion, who has enjoyed sauerkraut his whole life. But the same thing goes with vegetables like broccoli or Brussels sprouts. You don't see many children getting so excited about there being green food on their plate. And some children hate these foods to such extreme levels. But what is something that children always love? If it is on the menu, they will order it. Chicken nuggets. They have a food that they cling to. They love chicken nuggets and chicken tenders, but all the other food that they're unsure of, maybe it's green to them, it's evil food, they stay away from it. They have complete disgust towards it. Piggy eaters, it's the same way. We often complain about piggy eaters because they order the same thing every single time. Chicken tenders or chicken nuggets. But if this verse were talking about food, they follow it perfectly. They have a hate for what they believe is evil food, a deep hatred to where they will not even touch it or think about eating it, and they cling to what is good. What they know never disappoints. And when it comes to our spiritual lives, we need to be like little children in this sense. Cling to what is good, but what is evil. Regard it with disgust. Not even getting close to it. We want to be as far away from that as possible. Just as a child wants to be as far away from broccoli and sauerkraut as they can. Children provide great examples. Matthew 18 verses uh, two, and, uh, 2 through 3. It talks about little children there. In Matthew chapter 18. Then Jesus called a little child to him, sent him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And obviously that's uh, generally interpreted as, you know, little children, they're, they're blameless. They've done nothing wrong. And so Jesus is saying, unless you are become like little children, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, but... In the case that we're looking at it, you know, we kind of, if you do not become like little children and hate the things that are not good, then we will never be able to make this world a godly place again. If we are not hating evil things. 
We are commanded time and time again to flee from all sorts of evil. You know, we're told that in James uh, chapter 4 and verse 7, told that again in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9, we're constantly told to flee from evil. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 was read just a few moments ago in that scripture reading. Verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, the world was described as the present evil age. And when we become conformed to this world, we no longer shun the evil things that we are supposed to be shunning. Take entertainment, for example. How many times, I'm guilty of this, how many times do we get used to something that we should have no dealings with? Perhaps there's a TV show that uh, maybe the main character is, says a cuss word or something. It's just one. And we just brush it off because, oh, we hear that stuff all the time. It, it, we're not paying attention anyway. We just brush it off. But is that really how we should be acting when we're allowing ourselves to watch or listen to those things? By being conformed to this world, we are no longer shunning evil things. And this goes right back to the idea of leading by example. If we are actively shunning evil and not allowing the evil to be anywhere in our lives, people will notice. We may not think that people notice, but they do. So if we are going as far as possible to shun all the evil in this world, people will notice and people will take note of that. We may never know when or where we plant seeds, but we can plant seeds without even thinking about it, or without knowing that we planted a seed. One huge thing that we must uh, start ourselves in order to make this world a godly place is to shun people. Get away from it. Don't let it stick around. Cling to what is good. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Cling to what is good. And finally, we need to make God a priority in our lives. There are so many things that clamor for our attention and emotion. Maybe your job... If you have kids, your spouses, your hobbies, the demands and the distractions of life. And we have to be careful not to let them become more important or of more priority than our relationship with God. The first of the Ten Commandments states that we should have no other gods before Him. Yet how many of these things that occupy our lives, time, money, Thoughts and attention have taken the place of where God is supposed to be. How are we supposed to teach the word, lead by example, and shun evil if we are not making God a priority in our lives? How are we supposed to teach the word, lead by example, and shun evil if we are willingly allowing things to come in the way of God? How are we supposed to teach the word, lead by example, and shun evil if we are only making ourselves do the bare minimum when it comes to the Lord? I'd like to take sports as an example. If you're, let's say, part of a football team, and you hardly ever make it to practice, you don't make practice a priority, you skip practice often, what's game day going to look like? Are you going to play very good? If you don't study how the other team plays, are you going to be ready to play them? If you have not conditioned your body to play the whole game, will you be prepared to have strength and energy come the second half? To win a championship in any sport takes a lot. Studying, working out, conditioning yourself, practicing, building a strong relationship with your teammates. It takes so much, and you can't just skip when you feel like, when you don't feel like putting in the work, you can't just skip, and then expect to still win. When you skip practice, or you skip 
working out, it gives the, the opponent the advantage. So how can we expect ourselves to skip church, not make it a priority, not practice our faith, not work on our knowledge of God in the Bible, and not build a relationship with God, and expect to still be able to beat Satan in all of his schemes, and in so doing, bring the world to Christ. It's not how it works. In order to make America a godly nation again, then we need to be making God a top priority in our lives. In order to make this world a godly place, we must first do these things ourselves. You know, for any of you who have ever flown on an airplane, uh, you know those oxygen masks, if something's happening, you're going down, those ox oxygen masks will deploy. And you, you know, you're supposed to put them on so that you can have air and breathe. Well, what do they always tell you? You know, if you have uh, children or someone who needs help for some reason that's beside you, what do they always tell you about the masks? Put it on yourself first and then help others. Why? Well, if you don't put it on yourself first, then you don't have the oxygen to breathe. And so how are you supposed to help others if you can't breathe? So making America a godly nation again requires us to first teach the word, lead by example, shun evil, and make God a priority. We have to do all these things. If you don't mind, I, I would like to sing number 512, the world's Bible, with you. I've talked about this song uh, several times in recent lessons. Uh, it's probably because I heard a sermon on it a few months ago, and so it's been fresh on my brain, but... It's, it's very true that we may be the only Bible this world will ever read. From our example, there's people out there who have never even touched the Bible, and we're the only thing that they will ever see. For 512. I don't, I don't think I've actually ever led this, so hopefully I, hopefully I do good. <clears throat> Christ has no hands but our hands to do His work. Having your conduct honorable 
among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Lead by example. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by brotherhood in the world. Shun evil. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Make God a priority. These are all things that we must do if we expect to bring anybody to Christ. We're going to go ahead and we're going to sing the song of invitation that has been selected. If there's anyone here this morning who may be struggling and needs some help or uh, perhaps you have not yet been baptized and would like to take that step, we encourage you, if there's anything that is needed, to please make it known while we go ahead and stand and sing. Art thou gentle, points of Jesus? 